how will humans approach our lives differently when age isn't a limiting factor? Would we prioritize travel and expanding our knowledge or would human morality collapse if the threat of a few years in prison was nothing more than the blink of an eye in our infinite lives? Will we get bored? Or what are the mental health benefits that come when we don't have an expiration date? Does occupational success matter when everyone has time to explore as many occupations as they want? How does our mindset change about jobs, hobbies, and our own identity? What are we gonna value as a society if we redefine success? Does enlightenment seem like more of an achievable goal if you've got a few thousand years to tiptoe your way up to it? Welcome to Lifespan News, I'm Emmett Short. This is the fourth and final in our series on how the cure for aging is gonna affect the world. The first three episodes covered environmental impacts, economic changes, and how to govern a population that just keeps growing. In this episode, we're exploring how the cure for aging is gonna influence individual human perceptions of life. How does agelessness change human identity? Don't you wanna know what I do? No, no, not really. We're born. We go to school, we get a job, we retire, and we die. That's been the plan for hundreds of years. And even though our lifespan has increased, that plan still doesn't have much wiggle room. Even worse, each step is dependent on the previous one. Retirement is dependent on the quality of the job. The quality of the job is dependent on education. So if there are any stumbles along the way, the consequences have a cascading effect and your whole future feels at risk and the clock is ticking. That kind of pressure is inescapable and defines our expectations. Currently, teenagers worry that if they fail a high school class, they won't get into a good college, won't get a good job, and they'll spend all their time working to pay rent without any money to enjoy life. And those aren't the dumb ones, those are the smart ones. They see the problem. Now, according to Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, excessive pressure to excel ranks right up there with poverty, trauma, and discrimination as a factor harming adolescent wellness. Now, this type of thinking is described as a fixed mindset by Carol Dweck, psychologist and professor at Stanford University. The fixed mindset focuses on the concept that certain outcomes are just inescapable. If you're not good at math, that's the end of the discussion because it's a fixed fact. You're not good at math. But... The growth mindset allows for change. You might not be good at math yet. You understand that you're on a learning curve. It gives you a path into the future. But if we conquer aging, the pressure to perfectly execute every moment of life within a certain number of years becomes irrelevant. The obvious fixed mindset gets replaced by an even more obvious growth mindset. Anything becomes possible through practice and effort, and there's no penalty for taking your sweet, sweet time. Of course you can learn to play the guitar. The basics could take a year or three years, or it could take you seven years. Who cares? You got time. We humans are gonna be far less concerned with the outcome when we have time to start over. Now, beyond our own ideas of what's possible, we're gonna be living in a society of people who reflexively believe that experimentation and possibilities are the natural path forward. Even the way cultures approach work will shift. Now, right now, in success-driven cultures, it can be easy to identify the person you are as the same as the work you do. I'm a helicopter pilot, I'm a rodeo clown, I'm a space pirate. One of the first questions someone might ask when they meet you would be, what do you do? So even if you try not to conflate your identity with your job, someone else is gonna do it for you. Whether we like it or not, it's difficult to separate work from self, even if it's not true. We're not your job, not how much money you have in the bank, not the car you drive, not the contents of your wallet, We're not your fucking khakis. But in an ageless society, if time isn't a hurdle, and if anything can be learned in any amount of time, then anyone can put forth the effort to qualify for any job. So occupation no longer holds a high value. Over a long enough timeline, many people will tackle multiple jobs. Someone could spend 50 years as an incredible doctor, 100 years as a pretty good lawyer, and then 75 years as a mediocre romance novel author. And that's all before they go into porn. The result, uh, identifying as someone who performs a task is gonna seem wildly uninteresting. So. When anybody can do anything, what makes someone unique? You were born as an individual, completely unique. The DNA that comprises who you are has never existed 
in the millions of years of evolution that will never exist in the future. It is completely who you are. Your experiences as you grow up from one years and on is unique in the world. Nobody ever in the past or future will have exactly your experiences, exactly your parents, etc. That marks you as an individual, completely unique. It's like a seed that's planted at your birth, right? And if you cultivate that seed, if you cultivate that uniqueness, you discover your life's task and you have success and power and money will come to you and your life will be fulfilled. Now, it's worth noting that what makes us unique is the same now as it will be in the future. But in the future, our circumstances will shift in a way that personal experience has a greater value. People could have your same level of education. They would have the same time necessary to learn any skill you might have, but no one else will have made your exact choices. No one will have your stories. No one has your memories. Those will have unique value. And since you have time to meet everyone on the planet, you're gonna be very interested in what makes those other people unique. A cure for aging would provide a sense of freedom that cannot be understated. Without a time limit restricting you from becoming who you want to be. You can more effectively plan, study, and experiment until you find your perfect balance for everything you want in your life. Whatever you consider the perfect mixture of family, friends, charity, work, hobbies, and entertainment. And yet we'd still be left with the question, why? What's the point? What's the meaning of life? Why are we doing this? Again, this is a philosophical idea that has persisted for thousands of years and unlimited lifespan is not gonna change it much, but it will make it more relevant because it's gonna be unavoidable. Why is Elon Musk doing whatever it is he does? The overarching goal is to take the set of actions that are most likely to improve the probability that the future is good and that lead to the, uh, the expansion of consciousness and our understanding of the, the universe. I mean, that's a pretty good answer if he's limited to a hundred years on this planet or a thousand. Now, given more time, however, scope of our potential is much greater. For example, the Cologne Cathedral in Germany was under construction for 632 years. Why would generations of humans attempt to build something that they knew would take so long to complete that they'd never see the finished product? Because they were working towards an achievement they felt was worth that sacrifice. And the result? Germany's most famous landmark, which is flooded with 20,000 visitors daily. Boom, 20,000 visitors a day to see that accomplishment. So what kind of project would these workers undertake if they knew they could live long enough to see their completed building? Now, this is actually connected to one of the most ridiculous ideas associated with long lifespan. Aren't we gonna get bored? Now, given the time to have every potential human experience or something similar, it does seem like it would become tedious after a while, I mean, living forever could seem like torture, and people are right to worry that some activities that we find joy in could eventually lose their thrill. It's a concept called the hedonic treadmill or hedonic adaptation. So hedonic adaptation explains why the good stuff in life feels less good as time goes on. This is the dark side of hedonic adaptation. But there's a very bright side of hedonic adaptation too, which is that we also hedonically adapt to the bad stuff the bad stuff in life that feels really bad at first, it's not gonna keep feeling as bad as time goes on. But how is this connected to the concept of building a giant cathedral? Well, it turns out that immediate personal gratification from material goods and momentary satisfaction always returns to a baseline happiness. That's the hedonic adaptation. But the fulfillment derived from helping others, from personal sacrifice to a greater good or by doing something beyond our own self is called eudaimonic happiness, which is weird because it sounds like you're a demon. Eudaimonic? No, I'm not demonic. I'm I, I happy. <laughs> I'm nice. <laughs> and rather than become accustomed to this type of happiness, it actually continues to grow. Meaning, when humans have the option of living long, long lives, the greatest happiness is gonna be derived from our sense of contributing to something greater than ourselves. And that brings us to enlightenment. Now, it's possible that up to now, enlightenment has been hard to reach simply because we haven't had time. Maybe it takes hundreds of years of practice for a novice to achieve, in which case most of us just never had a chance. But with unlimited time to focus and really, really try, enlightenment might be in the cards for every human. 
What happens to society when we all reach a new level of enlightenment? You're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There is no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. Here's Tom with the weather. <laughs> and enlightenment is often described as a connectedness, a unity with everything, where we transcend ourselves. And because the self no longer matters, I am not my job, and my purpose is to create something greater than I am, it almost seems like the natural next step in human evolution. I mean, we became the dominant species thanks to our ability to communicate and cooperate in complex ways. So given a long enough timeline, a long enough lifespan, we might begin to operate as a single unified species of selfless individuals. That one's probably a long ways away, but not impossible. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Lifespan News. Please leave us a comment with how a longer lifespan would change your sense of purpose or your approach to life. To stay up to date on the cutting edge in longevity science, definitely go check out lifespan.io and make sure you give a like and a share to this video if you did like it and want to share it, no pressure. And we'll see you again soon in the next video. Bye.